Why do I want this job? Well, a month ago, I had a, uh, uh, what's the word? I had a light bulb moment and I realized that this would be the best job for me. Has this ever happened to you? You're having an English conversation, maybe an important one like that job interview, and you just lose the word that you want to say. You know that it's in there, but you just can't find it at the right moment. Well, I have some good news. You're not alone. This happens to many English learners. And today I want to help you grow your vocabulary skills so that you will have the words you want to say when you're having an English conversation or an interview. Hi, I'm Vanessa from speakenglishwithvanessa.com. And like always, I have created a wonderful PDF worksheet for you with all of today's 75 important English expressions that you will learn in the next hour. Incredible. You can download that free PDF worksheet with all of these expressions, definitions, sample sentences, and at the bottom of the worksheet, you can answer Vanessa's challenge question so that you never forget what you've learned. You can click on the link in the description to download that free PDF worksheet today. All right, let's get started with our first category, which are daily life items plus an idiom that goes with each of these items. That way you can connect these two expressions and never forget them. Let's watch. Let's get started with item number one and idiom number one. Do you know what this item is? This is a hammer. And what do you do with a hammer? <laughs> you hammer in a nail. So I want to help you with a great expression that we use to talk about hammers. The other day someone asked me, Vanessa, what's the point in learning a foreign language? Well, as you can imagine, this is something I feel very passionately about. <laughs> so I started talking for like 10 minutes about the benefits of learning a foreign language. You might say, I hammered, boom, 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 my point home. And this is the expression, to hammer your point home. And here point just means your ideas, your perspective. I really wanted that other person to see my perspective because I was so passionate about it. I told them all the benefits, all the great things that can happen, all of the excitement about learning a foreign language. So I wanted to hammer my point home. I didn't want to just say something simple. Instead, I wanted to make sure they understood. I wanted to hammer my point home. <laughs> Do you know what this item is? It's quite useful. It's a broom. My broom has some problems. It's really bent. I guess we were sweeping ferociously at some point. But there are two wonderful expressions that I'd like to teach you related to sweeping. Now notice that the verb is not to broom. You don't broom the floor. You sweep the floor with a broom. But what happens if you sweep something under the rug. Well, what happens to that item that you sweep under the rug? Is it visible for everyone to see? Nope, it is hidden. So if there is something in your life that you don't want to think about, usually this is something kind of serious. So let's imagine that your aunt and uncle have announced that they are getting a divorce. And when you see your aunt the next time, you want to talk to her. You want to see if she's okay. You want to talk about this, but she's silent. Oh, well, you might say, my aunt is deciding to sweep her divorce under the rug. That means she wants it to stay hidden and unspoken. Maybe she's dealing with a hard time, probably is. <laughs> maybe she just doesn't want to discuss it yet, or maybe she feels really uncomfortable discussing it. So she is sweeping it under the rug to keep it hidden. Now that expression is quite negative. We're sweeping something serious under the rug, but what happens if you get swept off your feet? Well, when you're sweeping the floor, usually you don't fall down, right? <laughs> but this expression to be swept off my feet has to do with love. <laughs> so you might say the first time that I saw him, I was swept off my feet. 
Maybe he didn't literally pick you up and carry you away. <laughs> but this idea that I could hardly walk, I was just floating. <laughs> he swept me off my feet when he brought me roses and chocolate and said so many nice things. This means you are in love. He swept me off my feet. <laughs> Here is my sink, and oh, it's looking beautiful right now. My husband Dan just did the dishes, so it is nicely cleaned. <laughs> but do you know what this is down here? This is the drain, and everything goes down the drain if it gets into that little hole. So here, water is going down the drain. Now what goes down the drain? Usually it's something that you don't wanna keep, hopefully. Hopefully not your rings or something important. Usually it's just waste. So here, water is going down the drain. But we can use this expression down the drain for other things that might be wasted. So you could say buying expensive clothes for your children. <laughs> is just money down the drain because your kids are gonna get them messy, they're gonna rip them. It is not a good investment to buy expensive clothes for your children. Buying expensive clothes for your children is just money down the drain. It's wasted. Do you know what this is called? This is a window. And what happens if I decide to throw something out the window? First of all, you might ask, why, Vanessa, would you throw something out the window? That's a good question. Well, this is the wonderful expression, out the window, not necessarily with throw, but take a look at this sentence. Our plans for a beautiful picnic went out the window when a thunderstorm rolled in. Okay, so our plans are out the window. Does this mean that I have a piece of paper that I'm balling up and really just throwing out the window? No, this just means that our plans had to change in kind of an unfortunate way, some way that I didn't want to have happen. So our plans went out the window when the storm rolled in. We had to come up with plan B because no one wants to have a picnic in the pouring down rain. What do you call this item? I actually don't have this item, <laughs> but there's a great expression I want to teach you with it. This is an iron. Notice the pronunciation, I-urn, iron, iron. This is an iron, and with an iron, you help to get wrinkles out of your clothes. This is making something smoother and nicer. So let's imagine an idiom that we can use with iron. Let's imagine that you and your friends would like to go on vacation to Venice. What a wonderful idea, but you've never gone on vacation with those friends before, and it's quite a big trip for you. So you might say, we need to iron out the details before we book our trip. You want to make sure that all of the wrinkles are smoothed out. Where are you gonna stay? What kind of trip would you like to have? Is this going to be a, a nightclub trip or is this going to be a sit in a coffee shop and look at the views type of trip? You want to iron out the details before you actually book the trip. Do you know what these are in English? These are light bulbs. And what happens if you have a light bulb moment? <laughs> Well, if you've ever watched any cartoons or anything animated, whenever someone gets a good idea, or maybe just an idea, they often have a light bulb appear above their heads. Aha, I have a great idea. <laughs> and that is referring to this wonderful expression, which is to have a light bulb moment. So for you in your English journey, perhaps you have been learning English for a long time in the classroom, studying some textbooks, maybe going to some local classes, and then one day you had a light bulb moment and you realized this method is not working for me. I have been doing this for years and years. Why aren't I more fluent in English? So you decided to go online and find some wonderful classes. <laughs> Maybe with Vanessa. So here you had a moment of inspiration, a light bulb moment. And now you're here learning English. Thank you.
Do you know what these are? This is a nut, the circular part, and this is a bolt. Now, we usually use these together. The nut fits onto the bolt and it screws onto the bolt. You can build pretty much anything if you have a nut and a bolt. So what does it mean to get down to the nuts and bolts of something? Well, when you look at a chair or a table, you don't really see the nuts and bolts, but are they important? Absolutely. And whoever built that chair or table needed to know exactly where the nuts and bolts went in order to build sturdy furniture. So here we're talking about the details. Sometimes these details aren't fun to plan out. Some people love planning the details of a project, but maybe you're someone who doesn't like to get down to the nuts and bolts of a project. So we might say, she has a lot of ideas, but she doesn't like to get down to the nuts and bolts of what will make the project actually work. <laughs> so it's fun to come up with ideas, but to actually do the project in detail isn't always so exciting. There's always going to be parts that will be difficult or less fun. So maybe you're someone who likes to get down to the nuts and bolts of a project, or maybe you're someone who likes to just have fun ideas. Do you know what this is? This machine here? This is a coffee maker. Well, a, there's a specific sound or verb that we sometimes use to talk about coffee, and it is percolate, percolate. Well, if you have ever made coffee with a coffee maker, you hear that kind of bubbling, gurgling sound as the steam rises and the water is heating and making the coffee. The <laughs> well, it hasn't finished making coffee yet, but it's in the process. There's also a lot of hot steam and hot water involved in percolating coffee. So, what does it mean when something else percolates? Take a look at this. You might say, when the boss sent the email to the entire company, he let it percolate before sending a follow-up email. Okay, so he's kind of letting it steam and boil throughout the company before he gives any kind of follow-up. We get the idea that this email might include some kind of surprising information, something maybe shocking, <laughs> and he's letting it grow and steam before he follows up with that message. So he's letting his email percolate throughout the office before sending a follow-up and explaining some more. What is this? This is a cookie jar. Right now there are no cookies in this because actually we use this to put coffee beans in and there are no more coffee beans. What a tragedy. <laughs> but a great expression that you can use about cookie jar is this, to be caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Okay, well, this goes back to the idea that as a child, you were probably not allowed to eat an endless amount of cookies, right? <laughs> so if your mom catches you with your hand in the cookie jar, you're probably gonna be in trouble. And that's the idea of this expression. We could say the politician got caught with his hand in the cookie jar when it was found out that he was stealing money from a company. Okay, well, it's not a good idea. It's not a good thing. <laughs> when someone gets their hand caught in the cookie jar because they've been doing something wrong. Do you know what this is? Where am I sitting? Very comfortably. <laughs> this is an armchair. There's a lot of different expressions for what to call this chair, but for the sake of this lesson, <laughs> this is an armchair. Usually it has arms that you can rest your arms on and rest your belly, a very pregnant belly. <laughs> but there's a wonderful expression that we can also use to talk about an armchair. What does it mean if someone says he is an armchair critic? Does it mean that he criticizes armchairs? Oh, that's not a good armchair. That's not a good armchair. <laughs> no, instead, we can imagine someone who doesn't have professional knowledge, but they are still a critic nonetheless. So we can imagine your Uncle John sitting in his armchair saying, 
oh, no, that policy by the government wasn't good, blah, blah, blah. Oh, no, I think that the neighborhood should do this. Well, does he really know? Is he really a professional in those areas? Nope, but he still has a lot of opinions. <laughs> so someone who is an armchair critic is someone who doesn't have professional experience, they still have an opinion, and maybe their opinion isn't the best opinion, but that's okay. Everyone is an armchair critic about something, right? But you can also use this to talk about yourself if you want to let someone know that you're not a professional. So you might say, when it comes to investments, I'm an armchair critic. I've read a lot of articles and studied a little bit about it, but I have really not a great idea about how to really be a good investor. So here I'm talking about myself. I'm acknowledging that I don't have a whole lot of experience with this, so don't take my opinion too seriously. I'm an armchair critic when it comes to investments. And you know, I still wanna talk about it, but I'm not a professional. So this is a great way to use armchair critic. <laughs> Do you know what this is called? <laughs> this is a table. It's one of the first words that you probably learn in English, a table. But what happens when something is on the table? Are we talking about a physical item being on the table? Nope. Here, look at this sample sentence. I told my boss that if the offer for a promotion is still on the table, I would like to accept it. <laughs> so here we can substitute the expression. I told my boss that if the offer for the promotion is still available, well, I would like to accept it. <laughs> so here we're talking about something that is available and usually it means something that's available to be discussed. There's a little nuance here that's talking about discussion. It's on the table. Now the opposite of this is something that is off the table. That means we do not discuss this. It is something that is completely off the table. We are finished, it's done. For example, if your family is talking about planning a vacation and one family member says, hey, why don't we take a huge trip and go to Indonesia? Well, your family members might say, I'm sorry, but that idea is off the table. It will take too much money and we don't have enough time to be able to go that far away. So here we're talking about the availability for discussion is pushed away. That idea is off the table. But I'd like to give you another expression talking about table, little bonus. What does it mean when something is under the table? When something's under the table, is it visible? Nope. Instead, it's something that's hidden. So usually we use this expression under the table to talk about paying someone or getting paid, doing some kind of transaction, not necessarily legally. It doesn't have to be extremely illegal. For example, when I was in high school, I was a babysitter for a couple neighborhood families. So we could say, I got paid under the table. It doesn't mean that they really gave me money under the table. It just means that I wasn't signed up by the government to have a business as a babysitter. No, they just gave me some cash and said, thanks for watching our kids. And I didn't really report that money. Shh, government, don't listen to me. <laughs> um, but this is pretty typical. If you walk someone's dog and they give you some money, okay, that might be under the table. They're just doing the transaction hidden Usually it's socially acceptable, <laughs> but this is the idea that it's not in the books. It's not your legal job. It's just something that's under the table. But of course, in some ways, this expression can be negative because if there is a legitimate business <laughs> and they are doing something under the table, well, it really gives that business a bad reputation. So for example, my father-in-law does a lot of international travel for his job and he told me that in some countries it's quite normal to bribe another company 
under the table in order to do a business deal with them. So this is not something that's written out officially. They're just saying, hey, we'll give you some extra money if you choose our company to do business with. Not very legal, at least in the US, this is considered unacceptable. <laughs> but in other cultures and other countries, this is something that's quite normal to do a deal under the table. So depending on where you're from, this might be okay or not okay. <laughs> What's this? What's this? <laughs> this is a tea kettle and this is a pot. For the sake of this fun expression that I'm about to teach you, let's imagine that this pot is black. It's actually silver, but the wonderful expression is the pot calling the kettle black. Well, if both of these are the same color, it would be a little bit strange for the pot to say, hey kettle, you're black. And the kettle would say, yeah pot, but you're black too. <laughs> so this idea here is when we're talking about someone pointing out a negative quality that really they also have. So this is also called hypocrisy. Let me give you an example. Let's imagine that I went to my friend Sarah's birthday party and I arrived 30 minutes late. She might say to me, Vanessa, why are you always so late? I might think in my head, hey, this is the pot calling the kettle black. Sarah's the one who's always late. <laughs> so I'm wondering why is she upset at me for being late? Because really she's the one who's chronically late. She's calling me the same color as her, the same problem that she really has. And kind of the nuance here is that she doesn't realize it. She doesn't realize the irony or the hypocrisy of her statement. Hey, that's the pot calling the kettle black. I was late one time. You are the one who's late all the time. Now, it wouldn't be very nice for me to say that to her at her birthday party, but that's the essence of the expression, the pot calling the kettle black. What are these items? These are tools. Here's a screwdriver and a wrench. And what is this? It's a knife. <laughs> but the expression that we use includes both of these. They can be interchanged in a way. <laughs> you might say, he's not the sharpest tool in the shed, or he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. What does this mean? Is this nice? Absolutely not. <laughs> this means someone's not very smart. That's basically the nuts and bolts of it, <laughs> is that it means you're not the sharpest tool in the shed. Ugh, there are a lot of people in the figurative shed <laughs> who are smarter than you. You're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Well, there are other people in the figurative drawer who are sharper than you. So my recommendation is do not tell someone this. <laughs> Do not say, oh, you're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Eh. <laughs> not nice. <laughs> but it is still a useful expression to know. You might hear this in a movie or TV show. And maybe, just maybe, when that person is not around, you might want to use that expression. So now you know. I hope that lesson hit the nail on the head. Let's go to our next set of important vocabulary expressions, which are expressions dealing with the seasons. Join me for an entire year as we talk about 20 important expressions for the seasons. Let's go. Let's get started with vocabulary from spring. Expression number one about springtime. Spring has sprung. The word spring has two different meanings. The first one is the season. This is springtime. You can see the flowers behind me. But also spring is a verb. To spring. To spring means to jump. So we might say the change from winter to spring is pretty shocking sometimes. <laughs> it's cold, it might be a little bit dark, and then all of a sudden oh, the sky's blue, flowers are blooming, spring has sprung. So this is the past tense of the word to spring, of this verb. So when spring happens you can say, oh, spring has finally sprung. What a beautiful time of the year. Spring expression number two is 
not a cloud in the sky. This is talking about the beautiful weather of spring. Yes, there is a lot of rain, <laughs> which we'll talk about in just a minute, but if you open the window and you look outside and there are no clouds, you could say, oh, what a beautiful day, not a cloud in the sky, lovely. Well, let's imagine that it is raining because it rains a lot in the springtime. You might need to cancel or change your plans based on the weather. So if it's raining, you might need to change your plans. We can use this as an idiom, no matter the weather. <laughs> you could say, I'm sorry, I need to take a rain check. I got really sick and I just can't come to the dinner party tonight. It doesn't mean that it's actually raining outside. It just means that you want to reschedule or delay something because something happened. You got sick and you know, you don't wanna to go to the dinner party when you're sick. So you might tell your friend, can I take a rain check? Maybe we could do this dinner party in two weeks when I'm feeling better. What a lovely expression. Let's take a rain check. Spring expression number four is a fun one. Let me show you this flower. Well, it's not exactly a flower yet, but it will become a flower. Well, what if I do this? <gasps> will this ever become a flower? Nope, I just killed it. It's gone. So we could say, I broke off or I took off that bud. That is the little piece of the flower that hasn't opened yet. We can use this to talk about behavior as well. We call that nipping it in the bud. <laughs> when you nip something in the bud, it means you stop something bad before it becomes worse. Obviously a flower is not bad, but that's just the imagery that we use. So let's imagine that your son lies to you. Oh. Well, you certainly don't want him to lie to you continually, so you need to nip that behavior in the bud. You need to nip it in the bud. You might tell him, hey, you know what? What you just did is lying and that's not something good. I'd rather you tell me the truth. <gasps> you are nipping that behavior in the bud. You're stopping it before it becomes something worse. Unfortunately, it's just a beautiful flower. <laughs> All right, let's go to our fifth spring expression. Our final spring expression is to be a fair weather friend. If I said, oh, you're a fair weather friend, would that be something positive or negative? <sighs> it would be definitely negative. You do not want to be a fair weather friend. Let's break this expression down. What is fair weather? Well, fair is good. Springtime has a lot of great weather. A lot of people think that spring is their favorite season because it's not too hot, it's not too cold, the flowers are blooming, oh, it's just so nice. So if you are a fair weather friend, what do you think happens when there's bad weather, or we can take this a little more figuratively, when bad things happen in life. That means you're not a good friend. When something bad happens, you just abandon your friend, you're not helpful to that friend because you are only a fair weather friend. So please don't be a fair weather friend. <laughs> Instead, we could say, stick with your friends through thick and thin. This is a wonderful thing to be. It means you're loyal, you care about your friends, and no matter what happens, you'll be there for them. So I hope that this is true for you. I hope that you stick with your friends and family through thick and thin. All right, let's go on to our five summer expressions. But right now it is springtime for me, so I will see you in a couple months <laughs> when I can record the summer expressions in the summertime. Welcome to summer. During the summer, we love to go swimming to cool off. So here are five common useful daily life expressions for the summertime. The first expression is actually kind of a, a special deal, four for one. <laughs> it's how to talk about how hot it is. First, you can say, it's boiling, it's blistering. Sometimes we say it's blistering hot, or it's a scorcher, or it's a hot one. All of these are beautiful expressions that you will hear in daily life to talk about the summertime heat. Summer expression number two is a heat wave. Yes, there are beautiful waves on the beach, but this is not a beautiful wave like that. <laughs> this means there's some unseasonably hot weather. 
summer's already hot, but when you have even hotter weather, you can say, Ugh, here in the south of the US, we are experiencing a heat wave and it is blistering hot. To go on vacation, I cannot wait to finally go on vacation and take some great time to relax. A similar expression that goes with that is to be off on vacation. So you might say, oh, I'm not gonna work on any new projects because next week I'm off on vacation. You're not gonna be in the office. You're gonna be enjoying the sun. Hopefully it's not boiling hot <laughs> and you will be off on vacation to head to the beach. As soon as I finish this video, I'm gonna head straight to the beach. Maybe it's the beach with the ocean or maybe it's a beach by a creek or a lake to chill out. Because summer is so hot, doesn't it feel great to just chill out? You could say, this summer I have no plans. I'm just gonna chill out by the pool and catch up on some reading. This is gonna be so relaxing. All right, I'll see you in a couple months in fall. Welcome to fall. This is a beautiful season here where I live in the south of the US. You can see the beautiful red maple trees behind me. We're gonna talk about five expressions about fall, but there's kind of a bonus because it's really 10 expressions. The first five are ways to describe this beautiful weather. The weather is brisk. Ooh, it's pretty brisk here in the mornings. I think fall is on the way. Brisk means chilly or cool. And when the weather is brisk, what do you want to do? You want to get cozy. Oh, I just love to get cozy, sit under a blanket and read a good book in the fall. Similar to brisk is crisp. Usually we talk about the word crisp to talk about something that's crunchy, but instead we can use it to talk about the cool weather. Oh, I just love those crisp mornings where I can sit on my deck and drink a hot cup of tea. Oftentimes in the fall, it's blustery. Blustery is a fun way to say windy, extremely windy. Here when it's blustery, all the leaves blow around and it's so beautiful. Talking about leaves, when you walk in the leaves, you can hear the rustling of leaves. This is the sound when you hear the crunch, crunch, crunch of leaves as you walk or maybe as they fall from the trees. This sound of rustling leaves is very typical in the fall. Fall expression number two, kind of, <laughs> is carving pumpkins. Have you ever done this before? This is a huge tradition in the US. Carving pumpkins has quickly become my son's favorite fall activity. We do it two or three times each fall because it's just so much fun. Take a look at this fun fall phrasal verb, to squirrel away something. Here in the US, there are so many squirrels. And right now in the fall, squirrels are everywhere. They're extremely active because what are they doing? They're hiding acorns and other nuts so that they can eat during the winter. We call this squirreling away. And even if you're not a squirrel, <laughs> you can squirrel away something by hiding it. Take a look at this. Guess what? I just found $20 in my coat pocket. I must have squirreled it away last winter and forgotten about it. What a surprise. <laughs> In the US, picking apples is a common fall tradition. So check out this apple idiom. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. This is when a child is similar to their parent. <laughs> so for me in the fall, I loved when my dad would rake up the leaves and put them at the bottom of the slide. And my sister and I whoosh, would slide down the slide and crash into the pile of leaves. And guess who likes to do this too? My kids, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. They also love to crash into a pile of leaves at the bottom of the slide. Unfortunately, sometimes bad things also happen in the fall time. The weather gets cooler and our immune systems sometimes are not prepared and we get a cold. So it's really common to say, sorry, I'm under the weather. This doesn't mean that you are under the sky, even though we always are. <laughs> this just means you're not feeling that great. It's not super serious, but maybe you have a sniffle, maybe you have a sore throat, you have a seasonal cold or allergies. You're just not feeling so hot. You're feeling under the weather. All right, I'll see you in a couple months in the winter. 
Welcome to winter. Let's talk about five expressions that have to do with the cold and winter. The first one is a rather strange one. It is the dead of winter. Let's imagine that you come up to me and say, Vanessa, do you want to go swimming? I might say, it's the dead of winter and you want to go swimming? Are you crazy? <laughs> the dead of winter is the coldest part of winter. You definitely don't want to go swimming outside. I mean, I guess some people like to take an ice plunge, but for me, <laughs> this is not the time when I want to go swimming. I don't want to swim in the dead of winter. Winter expression number two is the cold shoulder. <laughs> Take a look at this sentence and guess what it means. When I tried to talk to my sister last night, she gave me the cold shoulder. I guess she's still upset about our fight. Hmm. The cold shoulder is no fun and it is when someone intentionally, which means on purpose, shows you unfriendliness. Usually they ignore you. Sometimes being ignored can hurt deeper than mean words. <laughs> so my sister showed me the cold shoulder. That means she didn't talk to me because she was still upset about our fight. Winter expression number three is cabin fever. <laughs> I have cabin fever. I've been inside for two weeks. Oh my goodness. This is a terrible feeling. It's when it's cold outside or maybe you're sick. Maybe there's a pandemic. <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why you might be stuck inside. Maybe for a day or two, it's okay. And then after that, you start to go a little bit crazy. <laughs> you start to feel anxious, maybe nervous, restless, maybe irritable and angry. At that's because you have cabin fever. You need to get out, just bundle up, try to take a walk, brave the elements, try to get rid of cabin fever. Winter expression number four is a verb, to snowball. You might know what a snowball is. It's this. <laughs> That's the noun. But we're talking about it as a verb. Take a look at this sentence. I went to the grocery store when I was hungry, so I bought a couple snacks. And then it snowballed and I ended up with a cart full of junk food. Ugh, not a good idea to go to the grocery store when you're hungry. <laughs> so here we get the sense of it started small. I just got a couple snacks and then by the time I left the grocery store, my cart was full of snacks. It snowballed. Here it's the idea of something starting small and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Usually it's something negative. Here I'm talking about junk food, so it's something negative, but let's look at another situation. Lies tend to snowball. They start off small, then they get bigger and more complex and sometimes more dangerous. So just don't start off by lying. And finally, winter expression number five is the tip of the iceberg. When someone asks what I do for work and I say that I'm an English teacher, really that's just the tip of the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg refers to the small or maybe a visible part of something. If you know what a regular iceberg looks like, you can see the top, but under the water is the main part of the iceberg. So yes, I am an English teacher, that's what you see, but I am also a video maker, a marketer, <laughs> an entrepreneur who wears many hats. Being an English teacher is just the tip of the iceberg. A little note that we often use the word just with this expression. Being an English teacher is just the tip of the iceberg. Well, that lesson was just the tip of the iceberg. Let's go on to our next lesson with 15 important phrases that children say. Even if you don't have children and you don't work with children, you will absolutely hear children say these phrases in movies and TV shows. So make sure that you can understand them and know what they really mean. Let's watch. All right, let's get started with the first common phrase that children say, and who better to teach you children's English vocabulary than children? Let's watch. Look, Mom, look, Dad. Look, Mom, look, Dad. 
kids always want their parents or other adults to see what they're doing. So this is a really common phrase. Look, mom, I'm going down the slide. Look, mom, a really big spider. Look, dad. <laughs> so this phrase is maybe the one that I hear the most, but then again, my children are really young. So it's extremely common for young children to say, look, mom, look, dad. <laughs> I'm hungry. Is it snack time yet? I'm hungry. Is it snack time yet? Kids always seem to be hungry, right? <laughs> so when a child says, I'm hungry, is it snack time yet? What would the adult say to this situation? Well, they could say, no, it's dinner time soon. Don't spoil your appetite. That's what my mom said a lot. Don't spoil your appetite, which means if you eat now, you're not going to eat dinner later. Don't spoil your appetite. Or you might say, yeah, you can go grab an apple from the fridge. Cool. This is two different ways to respond to, is it snack time yet? I'm hungry. <laughs> why? 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 I think all young children around the world, no matter your native language or background, they all go through a why phase where the question, the response to everything is why? Why? If you say, let's eat breakfast. What are they gonna say? Why? <laughs> if you say, I'm going to drink my tea before we go to the park. They might say, why? <laughs> In fact, for my son, Freddie, <laughs> when he was two years old, he asked why so much. And sometimes in those situations, it made zero sense. For example, let me tell you a little silly story. Sometimes he would ask why with something he said himself. <laughs> so sometimes he would say, mom, let's go play Legos. And I would say, okay. And then he said, why? <laughs> supposed to respond to that but this is the essence of the why question it's just kind of a reflex that kids ask why why they're so curious about the world that's not fair that's not fair it's true that children have a really strong sense of what is just and what is unjust. Their sense of injustice is really strong. So they might use this phrase, it's not fair, or that's not fair, <laughs> when they sense that something is not just. So if they said, you got more cake than me, that's not fair. <laughs> they sense that there is an imbalance here and they might use this phrase, it's not fair. I'm bored. I'm bored. When kids aren't playing with something or someone else, they might say, I'm bored. <laughs> and there's two different ways that you can respond to this. There's probably a lot of ways you can respond. But if a child says, mom, I'm bored. Well, you could offer an activity. Hey, why don't you go get your new book and we can read it together? Okay, you're providing a suggestion. Sometimes in my house, this doesn't work because they just say, no, I don't want to. <laughs> Sometimes it works though, but you can also play it off as a little joke. Let me tell you a typical dad joke, as we call them. <laughs> this is because they are corny, not extremely funny. Usually you just roll your eyes ugh, <laughs> whenever you hear one, but but sometimes when I said, I'm bored to my dad, how did he respond? Hi, bored, nice to meet you, I'm dad. <laughs> how does a child respond to this except just roll their eyes? Oh, dad. <laughs> but it's just a funny way to respond. Maybe in your country too, there are dad jokes or parents respond with these kind of silly responses to just daily situations because you just gotta try to push through sometimes. <laughs> are we there no yet? Are we there no yet? So you heard this phrase at the beginning of today's lesson, but what is the most common phrase you hear in the car? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> Sometimes only 30 minutes into a long road trip, kids start asking, are we there yet? <laughs> and it's tough because kids don't really have a sense of time and maybe they're not in control of the trip. So they don't know you've got eight hours left in the car. <laughs> so they ask, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Or you can try to distract your children from asking, are we there yet? By playing some games. In our house, we like to play 
20 questions. We don't often count the 20 questions. Sometimes we call it, I'm thinking of an animal. <laughs> this works really well with young children. You can make it much more complicated for older children where one person thinks of an animal and each person in our family takes a turn. So if you're thinking of a tiger, other people have to ask yes or no questions. Is it a mammal? Is it bigger than um, a rabbit? <laughs> uh, does it eat plants? Does it eat meat? And you try to guess what that animal is. This is the most common car game in our family. Uh, I'm thinking of an animal, but you could change this to anything and have it be completely open-ended so that you can avoid the annoying question <laughs> of, are we there yet? <laughs> it wasn't me. I didn't do it. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. When something bad happens, what is the common phrase you're going to hear? It wasn't me. I didn't do it. <laughs> I think it's kind of human nature, right? That humans try to push away the blame from themselves and blame someone else. And maybe it really wasn't that child's fault, <laughs> but they don't want to get in trouble. So what do they say? It wasn't me, I didn't do it. If you hear a really loud crash in the other room and you run over to see what it was, well, I guarantee one of the children will say, I didn't do it, it wasn't me. <laughs> and maybe it wasn't their fault or maybe it was. I'm telling mom. I'm telling dad. I'm telling mom. I'm telling dad. Often when siblings can't get along and solve a problem, this is what you hear. I'm telling mom. I'm telling dad. <laughs> and they're trying to take their problem to a higher authority in hopes of justice. <laughs> so this phrase is coming up more and more often in my house as my sons, Theo and Freddie, play together and argue together. They're saying this more and more, and it's my goal as a parent to try to help them work out their problems together, but sometimes they need to come to us. And so I hear this phrase, uh, stop hitting me, I'm telling mom. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I'm there to try to help them, but I do want them to try to help each other and figure it out together at the same time. I don't, I don't like, like that. that. I don't, I don't like, like that. that. Unfortunately, it's pretty common that kids are picky eaters. Thankfully, my children eat everything. They are not picky at all. In fact, we might even say they eat us out of house and home, which means they eat so much food. But it is also common that children don't like unfamiliar foods or they feel uncomfortable trying unfamiliar foods. So they might say, I don't like that, or I don't like whatever the food is. I don't like chicken. I don't like tomatoes. <laughs> And what can you say to this? Well, I think in our house, the way we respond is, well, you don't have to eat it. It doesn't mean I'm going to make you something different, but you don't have to eat it. I'm not gonna force you to eat that. And maybe that's worked because they're not picky. They eat everything, but we just say, well, you don't have to eat it. I'm not going to make you a separate dinner, but you don't have to eat it. Sometimes parents respond when their children say, no, I don't like that. Sometimes parents say, how do you know you don't like it? You haven't even tried it yet. <laughs> or they might say, well, you only need to try two bites. This is a common cultural thing in the US where parents ask their children to eat two bites. This is just trying it. And you know a little secret? <laughs> In my family, we tell our children, you know what, last time that we had salmon, you didn't like it, but that was a month ago and our taste buds change all the time. So maybe this time you'll like it. <laughs> and it is true, our cells are always regenerating and changing and we do change the foods that we like. When I was a kid, I did not like salmon. I did not like sweet potatoes. Those were the two things I did not like. And now I love them. So it is true that our taste buds change, but I think it's important to tell kids that, you know, maybe the last time you didn't like it, but this time your taste buds might have changed. Why don't you give it a try and see if your taste buds have changed? And oftentimes this works. They'll try it and say, oh yeah, I like it now. Or maybe you prepared that food in a different way and now they like it. Because it's, I think it's important <laughs> that children enjoy the eating experience with their family. And it can be a lot of tension if they don't like a lot of foods. So this is a, a little trick that has worked for us. <laughs> Actually. Actually. 
kids love to correct someone. And what was really funny to me when my son, Freddie, I think when he was two years old, he started to use actually, and it was one of his first big words. This word is complicated because you're looking at a reality. Well, you like pancakes. And he might say, actually, I like waffles better. So it's kind of a complicated concept and it's a great big word for a child to start using. So when your kids want to correct someone else, they might say, actually, I like waffles better. And when my son was two and he said this, he couldn't pronounce it correctly. He said something like, actually, <laughs> and then it became more and more correct. And he said, actually, actually, and it became a little bit clearer as time went on. But but this is a fun way to correct someone and kids love doing that. I never want to play with you again. I never want to play with you again. Like we talked about with the previous phrase, kids love to correct someone. This has to do with a sense of power. Kids don't have much power or control in their lives. So what do they have control over? Well, they have control over their birthday, generally, <laughs> and who they play with, generally. So you might hear these two phrases when a child is angry and they're trying to have some power or control. You're not invited to my birthday party, or I'm never playing with you ever again. <laughs> I've actually heard my kids, actually, to use that phrase, <laughs> I've actually heard my kids say this to each other a few times, but do you know what? <laughs> Within five minutes, they're playing with each other again. So really, it's just a facade of power, a facade of anger. What is the strongest thing that they can think of to say? I'm never going to play with you ever again. Ooh, sounds so strong. And then they're playing together a couple minutes later. <laughs> You don't have to the the box box over over me. Me. To continue with the idea of power and control, <laughs> sometimes kids will say this to each other. Hopefully they don't say this to an adult, but it is possible. If they say, you're not the boss of me, ooh, it feels like I'm the boss of myself. I'm in control of myself and you can't tell me what to do. So you might hear this if an older sibling is talking to a younger sibling and the older sibling says, clean up those toys. The younger sibling might say, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> They're the one that's in control. Yeah, maybe it's their mess. Maybe it's their toys, but they want to have that sense of control. So they might say, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> Most kids don't want to be babied. To be babied means that you are treating someone like a baby. For babies, you have to take care of them completely because they're not capable of doing anything. <laughs> so as kids get older, they feel more sensitive about those types of things. So for example, <laughs> when I bring out the container of yogurt and I start to put it in my three-year-old's bowl, he might use this phrase, I'm not a baby, I can do it myself. <laughs> This idea that I'm old enough, I'm big enough. I think, it's isn't it ironic? Kids are always wanting to be bigger and not a baby. And then as adults, we think, oh, wouldn't it be nice to have just the carefree feelings of childhood again? <laughs> no one's satisfied where they are. So oftentimes kids will say, I'm not a baby, or it's possible, for example, if you are gonna watch a movie or a show and your child says, no, I don't wanna watch that, that's for babies. It's that same idea that, no, I'm too old to do that now. That's for babies. Seriously? 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 Now this phrase and our final phrase are ones that are used by older children. My children don't really use these yet on a daily basis, but this one means they're surprised. Really? Are you serious? And you just shorten this to one word, seriously? So I remember at birthday parties when I was a child, when someone gave me a present, I would just rip open the package and my mom would say, wait, Vanessa, you need to open the card first. But there's nothing harder for a child <laughs> than opening the card, reading the message before you open the exciting present. <laughs> so when my mom said, Vanessa, you need to open the card first before you open the present. 
I could say this. Seriously, I just want to open the present. <laughs> but really, it's polite to open the card before the present, read the nice message, see who the present's from, and then open the present. But a child might not be very happy with that, and they might say, seriously? <laughs> Jinx! Jinx! This phrase is a fun one. It's not one that my kids say regularly yet. It's for older children. It's not a bad word, but it's just something that they haven't learned yet. And it is jinx. <laughs> it's quite fun because you say this when you say the exact same thing as someone else at the exact same time. So when both kids say at the exact same time something, they will say jinx and try to say the word jinx first. Does this kind of game exist in your country? And sometimes we even add something onto this. Sometimes we just say jinx to acknowledge in kind of a fun way that we said something at the exact same time. But sometimes, at least when I was younger, we would say, Jinx, you owe me a pop. And pop is the Northern word in the South where I live now, people say Coke, but it's a soft drink, a soda like Coca-Cola. And we would say, you owe me a pop, which means you need to give me something special, like a special drink or something. But you can often just keep this at Jinx. But when you're watching a movie or TV show, you might hear people add something onto that, especially kids if they're having fun. Jinx, you owe me something. I don't know. You owe me a pop. You owe me uh, some candy. You owe me something because we said it at the same time and I said Jinx first. A fun little game. Well, I hope that you didn't say I'm bored because we have one more important lesson which will help you to grow your daily life vocabulary and express yourself completely. You're gonna learn some important phrases that I use all the time, but often I hear my English students not using these correctly. So let's dive in. The first expression that I use often, but my English students don't really know how to use, is to see someone off. We're not talking about seeing them walk off a cliff. <laughs> Instead, take a look at the sample sentence. When my sister was visiting me from California, I took her to the airport and saw her off. Ooh, saw her off? <laughs> This is just another way to say that I saw her leave. I saw her go through security and then she probably got on her flight and went home. I saw her off. The second expression that I use often but my English students don't use, and you should, <laughs> is to be floored. Does this mean that you are stuck to the floor? <laughs> Not at all. You might say, when I found out that I won a free trip to Japan, I was floored. <laughs> This is talking about being ultimately surprised. I couldn't believe my luck. I was floored. Expression number three that you should use is I found myself doing something. You could say, I went to a great concert and I found myself tapping my foot and bobbing my head and moving my body. <laughs> do you get the sense here that I'm not really choosing to do those things? It's kind of just coming over me. It's happening unintentionally. I found myself tapping my foot. You might even say this about my English lessons. You might say, I decided to watch one of Vanessa's English lessons and I found myself smiling the whole time. It was wonderful. I hope that that's true. The next expression that I use often and you should too is to pull it off. Are we talking about pulling something off physically? No. <laughs> Instead, we're talking about this in a more figurative way. So you might say, oh, I studied day and night for my difficult geometry exam. And you know what? I pulled it off. I got an A. <laughs> so you were not expecting to get an A, so you studied really hard. This was a difficult test. There was a difficult task and you succeeded. And that is pulling something off. You know what? I pulled it off. So if you see someone walking in your city who looks a little bit lost and you think, oh no, this is my chance. I should speak to them in English. I should help them, but oh, I'm so worried about it. Can I pull it off? And then you walk up to them and you say, excuse me, can I help you? And they say, oh yes. Can you help point me in the direction of the train station? And you help them. After that, you might say, I pulled it off. 
you succeeded in a difficult task. Success. The next expression that I use often and you should too is I'm drawing a blank. Okay, well, when you draw something, you're not drawing a blank piece of paper. <laughs> That's impossible. But here we're using this in a figurative way to talk about our minds. So if someone asks you, oh, do you remember the name of your kindergarten teacher? You might say, oh, I'm drawing a blank. That means that your mind is completely wiped fresh. It is wiped clean of any memory of your kindergarten teacher's name. Maybe it's there somewhere, but you can use this great expression and say, sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Do you know? <laughs> The next expression that I use often, and you should too, is to take a stab at something. Seems kind of violent, doesn't it? <laughs> but this is not a violent expression. Instead, it's talking about trying something that might seem a little bit difficult. So when I was growing up, my dad helped me with my math homework, and guess who helped my little sister with her math homework? Well, for a couple years, it was me. And then after it got too difficult, it was my dad. But we could say, I took a stab at helping my little sister with her math homework. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. So here I'm trying something that is a little bit difficult. I took a stab at trying to help her and I hope it was okay. The next expression that I use often and you should too is a fun one. Something is calling my name. Vanessa, Vanessa, what's calling my name? Oh, that seven layer chocolate cake is calling my name. Vanessa, eat me, Vanessa. <laughs> so of course the chocolate cake is not actually calling my name, but it's the idea here that it's something you cannot resist. That cake is calling my name. I have to try a bite. We often use this expression when it's something that you're tempted by. It's usually not something that's perfectly good. Eating an entire chocolate cake is certainly not a good idea. Maybe you're at a store and there's a really expensive, exciting shirt that you really want to buy. You might say, oh, it's calling my name. It's tempting me. I have to get it. <laughs> so here it is something that's not necessarily good, but not necessarily bad. It's just tempting you. It's calling your name. Buy me, buy me. <laughs> the next expression that I use all the time and you should too is it has your name written all over it. <laughs> Does this mean that I took a marker and I wrote your name all over that thing? <laughs> Well, not exactly, <laughs> but it feels like that. You might say, I bought you this sweater because it's your favorite color and I just thought it would look perfect on you. It had your name written all over it. Well, it would be pretty strange if a sweater actually had your name written all over it, kind of unusual. So here we're talking about something that's the perfect fit. Talking about something that's the perfect fit is our next expression that I use all the time and you should too, and that is, I couldn't help myself. That doesn't mean that I'm asking you for help because I can't help myself. No, instead, this is something you cannot resist. That seven layer chocolate cake, I just took a bite and then another bite and then another one because I couldn't help myself. Here we can substitute the word help for stop. I couldn't stop myself, I just kept eating it. But really in daily conversation, we use this expression, I couldn't help myself more often than I couldn't stop myself. So if you're taking a walk in your neighborhood and you see a cute little puppy, you might ask the owner, can I pet it? And if the owner says yes, you reach down and you pick it up and you snuggle it all, all over and you're so excited. And then you say, oh, sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> you couldn't resist how cute that little puppy was. Our final expression before our bonus expression that I use all the time and you should too is kind of an introductory expression. It is talk about, oh, we're gonna be using this for emphasis. Take a look at this sentence. I watched a documentary the other day about the world's richest people and they often own multiple mansions in multiple countries. Sometimes they own their own private island. Talk about wealthy. <laughs> so here I am emphasizing, yes, all of those things I listed show that they have a lot of money, but at the end, 
boom, I'm adding this expression, talk about wealthy. Whew, I'm really emphasizing the fact that they're wealthy, they have a lot of money. You might even use this to talk about English lessons. You could say, I can't believe that Vanessa gives us a free English lesson here on YouTube every Friday. Talk about generous. <laughs> okay, I'm tooting my own horn a little bit here, but if you're really grateful to have free English lessons every Friday, you could use this to emphasize the point. I feel so grateful. Talk about generous. What a wonderful thing. <laughs> All right, I wanna give you one bonus expression and it is to wing it. What in the world? <laughs> well, unfortunately, I use this a lot in my life. Can you imagine what to wing it means? Well, take a look at this. I didn't prepare a speech for my friend's wedding, so I think I'm just gonna wing it. Uh, this means it is not planned. I'm just gonna make it up as I go. I think I'm just gonna wing it. Or we can use this in the negative and say, I never just wing these YouTube videos. I always try to plan out a good topic, some good expressions, and some great sample sentences for you so that you can learn as much as possible. I don't wing it because I want to be a better teacher for you. Well, congratulations on leveling up your vocabulary so that you have the words you want to use when you speak. Don't forget to download the free PDF worksheet, which includes all of today's important vocabulary expressions. I think there's 75 or over 75 expressions, definitions, sample sentences, and you can answer Vanessa's challenge question at the bottom of that free worksheet. You can click on the link in the description to download that free PDF worksheet today. It's my gift to you to help you level up your English skills. Well, thank you so much for learning English with me, and I'll see you again next Friday for a new lesson here on my YouTube channel. Bye. But wait, do you want more? I recommend watching this video next, an hour of vocabulary, one more hour, where you will learn how to describe people in your life. Are they even keeled? Are they uptight? You'll learn how to use this and many other wonderful English vocabulary words. I'll see you there.